reading today can be found in Mark chapter 14, starting from verse 27. And if you are following in your journal, you'll find it starting on page 100. <clears throat> it's entitled, Jesus Predicts Peter's Denial. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And now Gethsemane. <coughs> they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus asked his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for an hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Let's just have a word of prayer before Peter uh, comes up to the pulpit this morning. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we lift up your servant Peter now praying that you will just bless him as he comes. You know the work that he's done. You know the study that he's uh, been undertaking and especially for the answered prayers that you've laid on his heart. Help him now to speak, speak boldly in this place. Help us, Lord, to listen and take to heart what you want us to take into our lives and for, it to be, for us to be uh, brought closer to you. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And can I also add my thanks to all the ladies of our fellowship? Thank you for all that you do. You're all mums to us all. Without you, we wouldn't get looked after. Thank you so much for the part you play in our church. I hope you're having a lovely Mother's Day. So, last week I told you the story of a little boy who was lost at Charing Cross. That Charing Cross in London is known as The Cross. And a policeman finds him and he's distressed and he can't tell him where his home is. Until eventually the policeman manages to get something out of him and the little boy says to the policeman, he says, if you take me to The Cross, I'll find my way home from there. And that's what we're doing. We're finding our way to the cross that we might find our way home from there. Are we on, Soph? So this is our series, 72 Hours That Changed the World, part two. And we're heading into the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's late. Are we struggling? 
Okay. Well, when you get it, put number two on. It's late. It's almost midnight. And now we're going to be leaving the upper room. We're going to get out of the city and we're going to travel the half a mile down the Kidron Valley slopes to the bottom of the Mount of Olives. We're heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. In Hebrew, that's known as Gat Shemanim, which means an oil press. In this Garden of Olives, on the slope of Olives, there was a, an oil press and there the, oil, the, the olives would be pressed and oil would be produced. So it's probably something like a little bit of a farm. The owner was probably a friend of Jesus because Jesus went there quite often and used this garden, this facility. It tells us elsewhere it was one of his favourite places to pray. Come with me as we walk down that valley. The night air is cool. It's dark. There's a certain amount of stealth to, to be taking place because Judas has now left the other 11 disciples and he's gone to do his business to get the authorities so he can betray Jesus. The disciples are no doubt still thinking about the Passover meal that they've just had. And they will have been thinking about those words that Jesus was saying to them about the bread being his body and the wine being his blood and trying to understand this change which for 1500 years this ceremony had held in a particular way and now it was something different. Imagine walking with the disciples when in verse 27 Jesus turns to them and says to them, you're all going to fall away. You're all going to fall away from me. And he says something from Zechariah. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, in their minds, first they're still coping with Judas's betrayal. And now all of us will fall away. All of us are going to fall away. How do you feel as you walk along with those disciples and Jesus says to them, you're all going to fall away? As you cross the Kidron Valley in that night air, will you fall away? Or have you already fallen away today? Will no one remain faithful to Jesus? It seems not. Not the disciples and not you and I either. You see, we all know, don't we, that Romans chapter 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us can claim that we are innocent. We have all sinned. And before we walked with Jesus, before we became Christians, we were sinners. Now, as Christians, we're sinners saved by grace. But the question still remains, will you, as a Christian, remain faithful and loyal to Jesus? What about when we choose to put ourselves before Jesus? Our desires, not his. We sin. We sin and we fall away. What about when we cheat on our expenses? We sin and we fall away. What about when we gossip about our friends? We sin and we fall away. When we look at those websites, whether the dangerous pornography or the overriding passion for that perfect home causes you to become idolatrous about your home or something else that means we'll fall away from Jesus, we sin. When we hold back from giving God our time and we don't make the effort to be at worship or studying his word, we sin and we fall away. And when we hold back our money from God, we sin and we fall away. When we take the Lord's name in vain and we blaspheme, we sin and we fall away. When we don't give him our attention and we don't pray as we should, we sin and we fall away. Okay, in our minds... You know, you're thinking about that now, and you're thinking, well, I'm not that bad. Oh my, you know, I do okay. I'm doing all right. I'm better than most people. I'm better than those other people. And yet that doesn't matter, does it? Because we're all going to fall away from Jesus when we sin. The moment our whole life is not wholly committed to and live for Jesus, we sin. The disciples were going to fall away from Jesus. And so can we. So can we. Well, the disciples, they're listening, and Peter already is preparing his defence. He's formulating a response as we walk along. You can hear his mind working and thinking, whoa, hang on a minute, Jesus. Uh, and maybe you are right now. You're maybe formulating your defence to the things that I've just said. Uh, and I wonder if they didn't just hear exactly what Jesus just said. Because they've missed something. Because if you go to verse 28, he actually says something which is absolutely life-changing. He says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Nothing. No comment. 
They don't even register what Jesus has just said. And it's rather important. But they're too busy thinking of a defence for what Jesus has just said about them falling away. Than they are listening to the truth of what Jesus has just said. About he's going to rise from the dead. And he's going to meet them in Galilee. The disciples miss the message of the resurrection. And where Jesus will meet them. And you know friends it's a message that you and I can miss. If we're not careful, we can miss it too. We said just a few weeks ago, when we looked at Peter's sermon in Acts, that we shouldn't talk about the cross without talking about the resurrection. Because they're both important. And here, Jesus is saying to them, I'm going ahead of you. I'm going ahead of you, and I'll meet you there. And you know, he says exactly the same thing to you and I. He says, I'm going to go ahead of you. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to go ahead of you, and I'm going to meet you there. If you take me to the cross... I'll find my way from there. Where will you find your way to? Where will we find our way to from the cross? Well, home, of course, because we're going home. We're going to be with Jesus, where Jesus is. Now, the message of the cross is vital, but for Jesus and for you and I, that's not the end of the story. Death, this world, you know, your problems today are not the end of the story. Keep going to the cross because beyond is home. That glorious thought. Even though we fall away as Christians, we must come back to the cross, confess our sin, because the day is coming when we are going home to be with Jesus, and we need to be ready. And what a glorious day that's going to be. We'll see Jesus, and we'll be in his presence forever. And I'm not sure the disciples were listening, and they may have missed the message. Make sure, friends, that you don't miss the message of the resurrection. You see, if we hold on to the message of the resurrection, that one day we're going to meet with Jesus, that's going to help us to live now. Because the thought of us meeting Jesus and explaining to him what we've done with our life, surely helps us to live a right life today. So hold on to the hope of the resurrection and look forward to that day and allow it to inform you how you live today. And then we get to a good old Peter. Verses 29 to 31, here we go. Even if all fall away, I will not, Jesus. I will not. I wonder, is there a hint that Peter might even be judging his friends here? You know, they're all going to fall away. I get that, Jesus, because they're a bit rubbish, these disciples. But me, oh no, I'm going to stick with you. Whatever happens. And then Jesus' precise answer to him. Notice how precise this is. Today, yes, tonight, Peter, before the cock crows twice... You yourself will disown me, not once, but three times. And then more emphatically, Peter comes back at Jesus again. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Go on, Peter. You tell Jesus. You tell him, you and the rest of you, because it says there that all the other ten said the same thing. Go on, you tell Jesus. Stay with him. Stick with him. And you know, friends, I've no doubt at all that they meant it. Fired up with love and passion for their friend. The one who had chosen them, their teacher. The one who had provided for them for three years. They loved him. Yes, we'll stick with you, Jesus. Come what may. But good intentions are not enough. When temptation comes, when we're tempted to put ourselves before Jesus, our desires are not him. When we're tempted to cheat on our expenses, to gossip about our friends... Tempted to look at those websites when we're tempted not to tell the whole truth. When we're tempted to hold back from giving our time and an effort to be at worship and studying his word. When we're tempted to hold back our money. When we're tempted not to give him our attention and pray as we should. When those things and another thousand temptations come along, our intention not to sin is not enough. Our intention not to sin will not be enough. Because we'll be in our own strength and it won't be enough. And we'll sin and we'll fall away from Jesus. Friends, life is a series of spiritual battles. And no matter how good and honourable our intentions are, we will fall every time if good intentions are all that we've got. The 15 to the 20 minute walk down the Kidron Valley is over. They arrive at the Garden of Eden. And he tells eight of the disciples, he said, you sit here. 
He said, I'm going to go on a little bit further. He takes Peter, James and John with him. The trusted inner circle. And he goes further into the garden. The night air is filled with the aroma of the olives and the woody trees that are there. And there's the occasional distant sound on the air in the light night Passover celebrations which are still taking place half a mile away in the city of Jerusalem. And in the garden, they see Jesus like they've never seen him before. He's deeply distressed and he's troubled. And Jesus says to Peter, James and John, he says, My soul, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now then, other versions tell us, other gospels tell us that Jesus sweat blood. It's an actual uh, condition, hematerosis. When somebody is such in anguish and stress that you can physically sweat blood. And Jesus was at that point of anguish to the point of death that he was sweating blood. And he tells those three disciples, he said, you stay here and keep watch. And he goes to pray. And you know, we may ask... Why is Jesus, the Son of God, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death? I'll tell you why. Because in these verses, we see Jesus, his complete divinity and his complete humanity. His divinity is shown when he knows exactly what it is that's going to happen. He knows that the disciples are going to fall away. He knows that Peter is going to fall away to the extent that before the cock crows, three times he's going to... He knows all that. He knows it in advance because he is the Son of God and he has divine knowledge. He's divine. And yet he's also entirely human. He's sweating drops of blood because the anxiety of what he's about to face is overwhelming for him and it causes him to be deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus knows what's coming because he's the son of God. But he's also human and he has to face it in his human body. And Jesus goes a little further and it tells us that he falls to the ground and he prays. This is not some sort of quick arrow prayer that sometimes we call them, shot up for immediate assistance, which are not wrong, by the way, except when they're the only types of prayer that you pray. See, what we have here is Jesus in earnest, deep, searching, soul-affirming prayer with God, his Father. His need was great and his prayer matched it. Is there another way, God? Is there another way? Can I still do what you want, but by a different route other than the cup and the cross? What was it that caused Jesus to recoil so much? Is it the Roman instrument of torture, which is said to be one of the worst ways to die? Was Jesus scared? Was he frightened of being killed? Was he scared of the cross? Was he fearful of the pain of crucifixion? No. No. That wasn't what caused his deep anxiety. It was something far worse than that. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. This is his prayer. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Do you know in the Old Testament, the New Testament, it, when, it, when it talks about the cup, this symbolises God's wrath. Judgment upon those who sin. Punishment for those who fail to seek God's forgiveness through Jesus. And this cup, full of the whole world's sin, was to be drunk by Jesus. Sinless, perfect, beautiful Jesus. A cup full of abhorrent acts and deeds. Offensive to God. A cup that contains your vile sin and my vile sin. The sin of the whole world. And at the cross, Jesus was going to have to drink this cup. He was going to have to taste and swallow the whole wrath of God's punishment upon sinful mankind. Take this cup from me. What trauma and horror. This is what Jesus prayed about. This is what Jesus was going to go on to do at the cross. But the thought of it, the anticipation of it, was too much to bear. It was crushing, it was agonising, it was terrifying. Yet Jesus always knew this was his destiny. Yes, he knew that, of course he did. He knew that this was to come, but the reality of it, it came to him in the garden. That night in the garden of Gethsemane, just hours before the crucifixion, it came to him. Friends, you and I, we need to spend time in the garden to realise the weight of what Jesus did for us. You see, it started, didn't it, really? It was in another garden called the Garden of Eden. 
which God had given that mankind had exchanged the perfect life for punishment because of their choice to sin. And here, all these years later in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, it was where God prepared Jesus to take that sin upon himself in order that we might be forgiven. To correct that which had gone wrong in the first garden. John Griffiths is a name you may never have heard. John Griffiths tended one of the huge railway bridges that crossed the mighty Mississippi. One of the ones that you pull the levers and the fingers up and allows the steamboats to go by. And when it's not, it's got the railway on. And this is a true story in 1937. One day he decides he's going to take his eight-year-old son called Greg to work with him to show him what dad did all day. The little boy was wide-eyed as his dad pushed and pulled the lever and the bridge went up and the steamers went through. And then they got some time to go and have the dinner and decided to go out and sit on the catwalk. There's no trains for a while, so they went out to have the, the lunch and time flew by as his dad was explaining, telling him stories. And the little fella sat there in awe of his dad and they, they listened and all of a sudden there was this shrieking sound of a train that brought them back to reality. And his dad heard the train whistle, he looked at his watch and Griffiths reminded himself that it was time for the Memphis Express. 400 people on board the train. It would in minutes be rushing over the bridge. He got just enough time to get back to the controls in order to lower the bridge for the train to cross. He tells his eight-year-old son, he says, you stay here because you're not going to have time to come back with me and I'll go and I'll do this and come back for you. He gets back, he gets his hand on the lever, he looks up and down the river and he makes sure there's no boats coming. And as he's been trained to do, he looks down one last time and he sees his son. And his son's caught in the gear mechanism of the bridge. He hasn't got time to go and get him out. What does he do? There's 400 people on a train coming and his son's in there. And he realises he has no other choice. So he buries his head in his arm and he pushes the lever and he sacrifices his son for the 400 people on the train. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. The cup of God's wrath had to be drunk by Jesus. No one else could die in our place. A sinless saviour had to die for sinful people that we might be set free. God had to sacrifice his only son, Jesus. Abba Father, take this cup from me. Jesus falls to the ground, totally focusing on the prayer with God, intent on speaking with his Abba Father. Dad, Father. He's got that intimate relationship with the one he was speaking with. He was earnest in his praying. I wonder what, by comparison, our prayer life is like. Are we so challenged by what we are praying for that we kneel, that we fall to the ground so that we can utterly focus on God and what we're praying about? Or is it a quick five minutes while we multitask and get on with the other things in life that seem to be so important? Do you know, in the early days of our marriage, I told you this story before, I, I had a skill, really, when we were praying, we'd be getting in bed and, and I'd be praying and all of a sudden I wouldn't be praying, I'd have stopped and I'd get the nudge and Sarah would wake me up and I would just go, Amen, and that would be the end of the prayer time. And Sarah's told you that story and it is humorous, it is funny, isn't it? But, you know, the reality of it is, it's really not that great, is it? Because it's a pretty poor show on my part, wasn't it? It wasn't exactly down on your knees, fervent praying, was it? That I could fall asleep and just finish it with a quick Amen. Not focused, earnest praying like Jesus was doing. You see, in fact, when Jesus went back to the disciples, he found them asleep. Simon, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch one hour? Watch and pray. Watch and pray, Simon, so that you won't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Simon Peter had had an extremely busy day. He'd, after all, he'd been sent off to go and make preparation for the Passover. He'd had to go and find that man with a pitcher of water. 
He'd had to then go up the stairs. He'd had to come back down and buy a lamb. And they'd had to go for the temple before three o'clock. Then he'd had to go to the market and buy the, 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 the greens and the fruits and all the rest of it. All the things that he needed. Then he had to come back and he had to prepare the room. Uh, and they were dealing with all of that. And then Jesus came and all the people. And then there was all the emotion of, of seeing Judas betraying Jesus and him going off. And now, now my last bit of adrenaline's just gone. When Jesus had said, we're all going to betray us. Peter fell asleep. And he's supposed to be keeping watch. When Jesus came back to him, what did he say? Oh, Peter, you must be really tired. You've had a long day. You can have a little sleep. No. Jesus didn't say that at all, did he? He said, Peter, I expected you to pray. I expected you to pray. So stay awake, to watch, to witness, to see me pray, to watch my agony, to support me, to do something for Jesus. And Jesus told him, he said, watch and pray. Don't fall into temptation, Peter. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you know, we said earlier, didn't we, that our intention not to sin was not enough. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus confirms it for Peter and for you and me. And he tells him what to do about it. He says, watch and pray. Be aware of the dangers and the temptations which are going to come your way from the enemy and pray about them. And there really is no excuse, is there? It doesn't matter how long a day we've had, how tired we are, how busy we are, how upset we are, how chilled we are. The message is simple. It's watch and pray. If we want to win spiritual battles that inevitably we will face... If we want to overcome all those temptations to the things we talked about before, if we want to draw closer to God, then our prayer life has to be earnest, deep, intimate, purposeful prayer. Jesus set the example for us to follow. You may have heard of the Clapham sect of British social reformers. It went on and it's been going on for a couple of centuries. William Wilberforce, famous name, was one of the people who ran it and organised it when it first started. And of course they fought for the abolition of slavery. And they also in the organisation had a zeal for missionary work. And it said that they daily gave themselves to three hours of prayer. That they organised other Christians throughout the country to unite in special prayer times before particular debates and acts of parliament that were being passed in the government. Friends, as individuals in a church, if we want prayer to change things, we need to have earnest, committed devotion to prayer. Well, Jesus leaves the disciples and he, he goes again to pray. He leaves them a second time. He goes and prays the same prayer. Do you notice that? The same prayer. Have you ever wondered if you can ask God for the same thing twice? Well, Jesus did. And he was God's son. Back for a second time of prayer with exactly the same prayer. And you know, friends, there may be times when you pray in your prayer life when God appears to be silent and not hearing you. There may be times when you think God is not even listening. But I want you to keep on persevering in prayer. Because God loves to listen. He loves it when you persevere in prayer because it shows that you trust him and you have faith that you keep on bringing that matter that concerns you so greatly to him. And in God's good time, he'll answer. And he loves it when you persist in your praying. Do you also notice that when Jesus prayed his prayer, he said this, everything is possible for you, Father. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Does that encourage you this morning? Because it should. Everything is possible for you, Father. Jesus knew that God could do anything, even take away the cup that Jesus was facing. He could even find another route for man's salvation. And this morning, the prayer for your loved one and your friends to be saved, it's possible with God. Healing from disease, it's possible with God. Promotion at work, it's possible with God. New church building at Appleton Cross, it's possible with God. Revival across Appleton, it's possible with God. Restoration of restored relationships, it's possible with God. To be free from depression and illness, it's possible with God. Help with your finances, it's possible with God. The list is endless. Whatever you could possibly bring before God for help with, is possible with God. Isn't that good this morning? Jesus prays again. Take this cup from me. 
Jesus comes back a second time to the disciples and he finds them asleep again. Can you imagine? And it says that they didn't know what to say to him this time. In their moment of great need for Jesus, Jesus wanted them to watch and pray and instead they fell asleep. How embarrassing. How embarrassing. Peter had said that he would fight for Jesus even if it cost him his life and all Jesus asked him to do was stay awake and watch and pray. He couldn't even do that. What about when Jesus speaks to you and me? On that day when we stand before him and give an account of our life, will we know what to say or will we have nothing to say about our prayer life? Will we be embarrassed as the disciples were or will we have something to say? Or will we have nothing to say because our prayer life is so impoverished? Some years ago, there was a young girl who was very sick and she wasn't expected to recover. And because of her love for Jesus, she was, she was troubled that she'd not been able to do more with her young life. And she spoke to her pastor about it and the pastor suggested, he said to her, well, why don't you make a list of the, of the people in their little town who need Jesus to be their saviour and pray that they might put their faith in him? And she took his advice. She makes a list and she prayed often for each person. Sometime later, God began to stir a revival in that town. And the girl heard of the people coming to Christ. And one by one, she ticked them off her list. Those who had been led to the Lord as saviour. After the girl died, a prayer list was found under a pillow. There were 56 names on it. Every single one of those names had come to know Jesus as a saviour. The last one of which, the night before the little girl died. Such is the power of definite, specific, fervent prayer. Can I ask you this morning, have you got a prayer list? And are you praying? Jesus goes and prays again. Father, take this cup from me. Everything is possible with you, Father. But I want us to know something really important. Did you notice what else Jesus prayed? He said, yet not my will, but your will. Jesus was earnest, persistent, dedicated to praying for the removal of that cup of wrath. He knew that everything was possible for God. However, he also knew and trusted that God's will was always right. That the answer that God would give would be the right answer at the right time for the right outcome. Jesus loved his father God and he trusted him without question. And he knew that his father God, by his very nature, is full of grace and love and mercy. And that he could be trusted to answer that prayer in the right way. Of course, you and I know, because we've got all the story, that that cup of wrath with all that sin in it, with all that punishment in it, was not removed from Jesus. In just a few hours, Jesus, our beautiful, perfect, sinless saviour, his father would lead him and hand him over and give him over to the cross. And Jesus would drink every last drop of the cup of judgment and wrath. Taking the sin of the whole world and enduring the most crushing, devastating, horrendous, vile punishment for other people's sin. And in that moment, even separation from God himself in order that you and I can be pardoned. Sometimes God answers our prayers in the way that we ask them. The healing, the promotion, the new church building, the finance we need. But other times, God says no. Sometimes our suffering is removed and other times we have to endure it. Jesus came back a third time. Are you still sleeping and resting? He'd fallen asleep again. And he said this, enough Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. And in those words, enough, the hour has come, we've got to read it this way. That's it. God has answered, I am ready, the business is concluded, the matter is settled, the Son of Man was to be delivered by God's purpose into the hands of sinners because God was in control and that was it. Jesus had prayed and he'd received the answer and now he was ready. 
We know from Dr. Luke's account of it that God sent an angel to strengthen Jesus as he prayed. And now we witness Jesus, the man, no longer crushed. No longer deeply distressed. No longer troubled. No longer was his soul overwhelmed to the point of death. We see Jesus stood up. The hour has come. I'm ready. I'm ready to accept the cup to drink. With the sound of Judas and the temple police, the clanging of swords growing nearer in the night air, Jesus is ready. Enough. It's done. God has decided. I'm equipped for what is to come. When God answers our prayers, sometimes he gives us what we request. Other times, he simply equips and strengthens us to deal with what we're facing. To encounter what we're facing with peace that comes from him. To encounter what we're facing with joy in our hearts. Because he fills us and helps us to deal with the problem. Enough. The hour has come. Jesus went on to drink the cup. And he won the greatest victory that's ever been won. In your current trial... In future trials and temptations, in the daily spiritual battles that we call to fight, the message is as simple as it's effective. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Keep looking to Jesus. Pray in earnest perseverance, knowing that God can do everything. Nothing is impossible for him. And when you pray to God, say to him, yet not what I will, but what you will. And the God of all creation who loves you so much that he was prepared to give over his only son to die for you will answer you by either gifting you with what you ask for or giving you all you need and equipping you to deal with whatever it is you to face. It's when we submit completely and utterly to God's will by watching and praying that battles are won. God changes things and we are led in great peace and joy throughout our lives to face our own trials and temptations. But I will reassure you of this. There is no safer or better place to be than right there in the centre of God's will. Because there is where we get to when we watch and pray. And it's then that God does great things in us and through us as he works out his purposes in our life the sound of the temple police is really quite loud now and the clanging is in the garden it's obvious that they're just a few yards away Jesus says rise let us go lads stand up and he faces the opposition he gets his men to be stood next to him strengthened and assured of God's will and presence Jesus prepares to leave that garden of anguish And his preparation was fully equipped to meet all the demands that the cross and the cup would be placed upon him. And as we pray about our needs this morning, about our church's needs, we leave our cares and our burdens with Jesus. And we're ready to meet all the demands of the week ahead. Next week we witness the betrayal by a trusted friend, the arrest by the temple police and an appearance before the court of the Sanhedrin. We're nearly at the cross and we'll find our way home from there. Until then, watch and pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful part of the story of your life in Jesus. We thank you for the events of the Garden of Gethsemane. We thank you that in it we can see Jesus' complete divinity and his complete humanity. Father, as we realise afresh that the cup of wrath contains our sin and the sins of the whole world and that our beautiful, sinless Saviour Jesus drank it every last drop, we give thanks and praise him. We thank you that he endured the agony, the anguish, the terror of that garden. We thank you that he did it for us. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you allow us to come and talk to you. We thank you that the instruction to us today is the same as it was for the disciples all those years ago, that we must watch and pray. That we must live this life in prayer, trusting you, 
trusting that you will help us with all the trials and all the temptations and all the spiritual battles that we're going to face this week. Lord, I pray for your church here in Appleton that you would strengthen us, that we might rise as Jesus rose from that garden, ready to face all that was to come, that we would do the same today. Help us in our praying, help us in our watching. Help us to look forward to the resurrection, that day when we will be with you in all of eternity and let it inform the way in which we live today. Help us, Father, we pray, that we might bring you glory. And we ask this in the precious name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen.